at a distance only. I hope that you will be here uh, in, a, in a real person. But at least this contact is possible. Uh, we have had here some of our line travel for some hours ago. But unfortunately, he has a boat, so we can't be here right now. So it's a rather limited present, but uh, we can still discuss important matters. So I, I hope that, uh, that you can lead the discussions and uh, uh, I can uh, try to accomplish the Uh, you have not heard what I have said. Uh, I just wanted to greet you. I am glad to, to meet you again, at least at a distance, because I have been in touch several times. And uh, since you can't be here, we hope that you will at least tell us something which is happening right now in the United States, which arises attraction all over the world. I believe this is the, the most important topic right now. Have you heard me now? Yes. Um, so I think, uh, Tomas, is there someone playing music in the background for you? Yes. But so maybe you could put, it's okay, but maybe you could put it on mute while you're not talking. I mean, I, I know that uh, Ned will go first, but then in the meantime, maybe you can put it on mute. Tomas goes first. Tomas, so you're not doing an introduction Ned? Uh, sorry, um, Tomas first. Tomas first, me second. Okay. Uh, Ned third, and you fourth. Okay. I, okay, that's just some of your, your comment is relevant. I'll try to do that, but, but since I'm supposed to go first, I could do it after that. Wait, let me give you a short introduction. Yuri, can I give a short introduction of the panel to the people in Prague? Yes, in, in Prague, uh, uh, we hope for uh, Senator Gavra, but he is not here. Then, uh, I don't see his assistant, um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Ali Machon. She is probably at the hotel with him because he's not feeling well. So the the uh, the person in charge of this conference is uh, Dr. Marek Rubetz. Is there, he's sitting there, I don't know if you see him. And then there is uh, engineer Perikavitz, which is an important collaborator of our group. And then there is uh, uh, Mrs. Mimus Kotishova, who has proposed a, an electronic system of voting, which is a promising development to and I agree. And then, of course, uh, Dr. Martin Brabetz, who is in charge of this Prague Centre. And uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Lukasz Kantor is here too. You will know him. He has uh, written an article about your book. So, so these are the persons who, who are here and who, uh, who follow the discussions. Can you hear me? Uh, I, I can hear you. I don't know if you hear me. Yes, we can hear you now. 
Yes, can you sure. see well, can you see the four of us and you yes, on the yes I, I can see you, uh, Mr. Crosby, Professor Olin and uh, Mrs. Susanna as clients. I, I can see these four persons. Excellent. Uh, I would like to give an introduction of the panel. I would like to introduce who these people are. Yes. Thank you. Okay, let me do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, the first person to speak will be Diane. Uh -huh. Dr. Thomas Olin from Stockholm has long been an advocate of deliberative democracy in Sweden and in the world. He is in Venice, Italy, at the Internet Cafe, that he will talk about the group of what he foresaw back in the 1970s and what he has done in Sweden and what's happening in Sweden. The next person to speak will be myself, Dr. Ted Becker, at Auburn University for my office, where I too will add to what his visions are starting in the 1970s. Give a little bit of thought about what I think needs to be done and what is actually being done to actually materialize those visions. The third person to speak will be Dr. Ned Crosby, who set up the Jefferson Center in Minneapolis in the early 1970s, I believe. And he will discuss his citizen jury project and how he, after many years of experimentation, has embedded the citizen jury process into the citizens' initiative process of the state of Oregon. And that project, that project is ongoing. And the last person to speak will be Susanna hans Lyon, who was, the, uh, in a sense, the number two person uh, on staff at the British Columbia Citizens' Assembly that was held in the early part of maybe five or six years ago, which was uh, uh, replicated in Ontario and the Netherlands, and which is absolutely exactly what the vision by myself made in 1976. I wrote my book, American Government, Past, Present, and Future, and a book for New America, which I'll read a little bit from when I get my 10th, 15th minute. So that's the pen, and that's the order we'll go. We'll try to keep our remarks to 10 minutes, 15 minutes max, and then we will take questions from those at the front. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm proud to be able to start this discussion. I'll try to be quite brief, but it is exciting to think back uh, to the 1960s when uh, I had the feeling that um, uh, citizens were uh, out of the influence that they would be so interested in getting. We, in my country, and our, my country, Sweden and not Italy, <laughs> um, we had a very strong representative democracy for so long, and uh, we still have, as a matter of fact. Uh, I, I thought that if some kind of new possibility to communicate between citizens would appear, uh, things would, would possibly change. And I came to know that uh, at the time, in the late 60s, there were experiments going on trying to hook on the television set to the telephone. And uh, some people try to, 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 to add an uh, uh, offline uh, keyboard to, to that equipment and started experiments. And I thought that that was fascinating. Only, uh, to my mind, the important usage was not for entertainment as it was, as it was supposed when the experiments started, some in England and some in France. Not entertainment, but rather some kind of, of a democratic situation. So I wrote uh, a, a vision and published in a leading Swedish newspaper where I uh, suggested that the 
in some years to come would be some kind of equipment in the homes of people that would make it possible to communicate between people and between people and some kind of decision making system uh, in, in the middle we might say. And I suggested that it would, could be formed in panels. Uh, my number of participants was 10,000 for big panels like 10,000 people has been reviewed in every three months. Well, I okay. um, it would be a possibility for people to communicate with the public. And uh, of course, the main central political questions are magnitude are, are quite often difficult, but, but there are so many local and so many questions that are close to people where you do not need to be an expert. And I thought that this kind of local democracy would be a wonderful application for a system where in some future uh, people would have access at home. Now, this was published in 71, and the personal computer, of course, was not around. Of course not, and came so much later. But I was astonished that it did take so long until this discussion continued. In the beginning, I had no response at all for years, several years. And uh, actually, you might say that the 70s, at least around me in, in the Nordic countries, that I have friends in, in the other Nordic countries, of course, uh, was very low. It was not until the Mitel system in France, which was uh, during the uh, during the seventies, and uh, it was astonishing then that that not so much happened. And uh, um, I had the feeling that that was not expected. Um, for me, I did not have a chance to continue that change to my interest and to public services in general, the, the, um, and not just communicating democratically. And I did be present uh, in the discussions in, in our countries around here for, for quite some time. But only I was astonished that the politicians were uh, interested to a very small degree. And you could feel that some people, some politicians even were, quote, afraid, unquote, of, of uh, distributing power to, to the citizens. Um, one experiment I did was in, in around the, the year 2000, I uh, collected the number of 300 elderly people in a suburb to Stockholm and uh, asked them to uh, define first uh, uh, what kind of local subject that they would be interested in, in deciding on and then later in the phase two of that experiment to actually make a combined uh, a deliberative decision on that. And that, that happened and it was exciting to see what 300 elderly, yeah, how excited they would be and, and how inviting they were afterwards to do it again. Because as quite a number of them noted, uh, they had a chance to address uh, Programs, questions of interest to them. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, round up here with a comment about the situation now. Um, in the Nordic countries, we have an increasing number of uh, citizen dialogue projects in communities around. Uh, there is being formed panels of different sizes and of different uh, uh, form, I would say. Um, and uh, there are many experiments with citizen budgeting 
Of course, since the budgeting matter has been a need not for some money in the world budget, but as well as an information matter. Really. Um, still, uh, although there are so many now dried uh, out projects being started and some have been running for, for a number of years, uh, it is still quite a distance to the, the uh, local decision making system, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we, we might say that uh, to reach influence, you have to at least have a good chance to formulate your will to see what, to act on what should be implemented. So, although it has taken now four years since those thoughts that I had, uh, which is amazing, uh, I still feel the, 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 the creeps on my back when I, when I had that first contact with this type of thinking. Uh, and it's fascinating to see that we are alive and we are at full strength and we are here to, to get this thing going and I'm very, very happy to be in the group here and in the presence of this little village of us. So, thank you very much. Okay, uh, and now it's my turn. And uh, thank you, Tomas, uh, that uh, you give me an extra few minutes to talk, which I appreciate. Um, and then we have Danae and then Susanna as the practitioners. Um, I, um, I soon began my thinking about how the system would become more democratic and therefore more just and, um, I think, functional society uh, in the early 1970s and during the uh, great uh, turbulence of the 1960s and early 1970s when there were protests against the ruling establishment that was called at the time, uh, the corporate uh, elites that ran the country is the way I saw it. I called them the central elite in a book that I wrote in 1976, uh, which was after uh, everything had kind of begun to simmer down from these turbulent times in the 1960s. And I wrote two books in 1976, which was 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, uh, where the American people, in a truly democratic spirit, overthrew uh, a oligarchy uh, in uh, England, the monarchy and the parliament of England, as being a ruling elite they no longer wanted to be associated with. So we had a celebration in 1976 called the Bicentennial, 200th anniversary, and uh, this book emanated from it. And I'm quite shocked as I occupy Wall Street, uh, spread across the United States of America, and be emulated. I have two colleagues, one in Copenhagen and one in Athens, who are part of the Occupy Athens and the Occupy Copenhagen movement. It's spreading around the world. It's a delight to see because it's the first time. By the way, Tomas, hit you, hit the uh, so that we can hear. Uh, and so, you know, we can't hear it going in. Can you see the mute button? Good. No, you know. Is that, is that okay? Susanna, where's the mute button? Um, usually if you have your um, cursor over the screen, a mute button will show up, but um, depends on the... Is this the, seven or seven, Susanna? Number seven? Might be, depends on the mirror. I'm sorry. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The other thing you could do, oh, that would make you lose this. You can just mute on your, on your headphones themselves. Um, uh, yeah, I can yeah, switch it off. Now I'm going to do it and my switch off now. Good. Okay. If you can hear us, we can hear you. Not if you can hear us. Not if you can hear us. Okay, good. Okay, so this is what I wrote in 1996. We believe governmental structures should be organized to promote and stimulate direct and substantial participation in government politics by all adult members of society. 
We believe that the basic political comprehension skill of average citizens is sufficient to let them participate in major decisions that affect the majority of the people. We prefer government alternatives that would generate and reinforce citizen contributions to every key aspect of political and social decision making at every level of governance. This means that all relevant facts and opinion must be out in the open for one and all to hear, consider, and vote upon. There must be an absolute minimum amount of government secrecy from the people, if any. We further believe that the costs inherent in the inefficiency of wholesale democracy will be greatly outweighed by A, the mass personal satisfaction derived by all who participate, B, the greater adherence to the laws passed, um, uh, and then I go on. And then I go on further and I say, many people have begun to sense the true nature of the problem. They're beginning to realize that there is more in common among the people who are running things all around the world than the eye. They're beginning to understand that the great struggle is one between the peoples of these various societies and their rulers, no matter how quote or democratic, unquote, the political structure is supposed to be, whether it is state capitalism, socialism, representative democracy, or whatever. The real struggle, as it's starting to emerge more clearly, and I wrote this in 1976, is elitism versus democracy. How has this happened? In the late 1960s and early 1970s, seeds were sown from pro-democratic evolutions of the future, and some are taking root. Well, they took root. It may have been the end of the turbulence of the 1960s and 70s. What happened then was people like Ned Crosby and myself and Thomas O'Lean and others began to develop various kinds of participatory democratic processes that were totally new. Because what happened in the 1960s was that the ruling elite, when they saw all of this turbulence, and they had to change their policies and pass environmental law and let women into the political structures that we had, and let that the minorities into it, and they absorbed them. They didn't change the system at all. No changes in the systems make them any more democratic. So we began to think, how would you have a more democratic and inclusive process here? And experiments began to take root that have been growing over the past 30 years using this kind of theory as a backdrop. And the experiments that I did were the first scientific deliberate poll that I did in New Zealand and uh, Hawaii and in California. Ned was doing his citizen juries, which he did for some 25 or 30 years in Minnesota and also in Washington, D.C. Um, things were happening in other people who were developing uh, other kinds of electronic down meetings that were being done. And what this has led to is this explosion that has begun with Occupy Wall Street, which as far as in my lifetime, 79 years old, is the first in my lifetime where I have seen true democratic, new alternative, in a sense, culture take root right near Wall Street, a couple blocks away actually, uh, where their theory their ideas are exactly what I expressed in my thread theme. If you take a look at their method of citizen assembly that they're using, where they have between hundreds and a thousand people, where they have no, no microphone, they're not allowed to use any amplification, you can see how they work it. And the goal is not to have a majority vote. Their goal is to develop the consensus of everybody that's there, and they have developed all kinds of hand signals, and to, and to use facilitation methods. They don't have any leaders. They have nobody who runs the show. They have what they call facilitation committee that uses and, and brings about the consensus of the general assembly, which then passes on to various task groups to carry out what it is they decide they're going to do. But this kind of a democratic philosophy underlying the protests that you see 
is really at the core of the new transformation of democracy that Ned, myself, Thomas were talking about in the early 1970s. The kind of uh, system where the people are uh, the equal partners, every other person in the polity to develop the agendas, the priorities, uh, the policies, and the invitation so that it is a democratic society. So, uh, I personally, uh, uh, what I came up with uh, were the three pillars of national democratic society. And this was just my, my vision at the time. And I'm beginning to see that each of them actually is beginning to take root and take hold. Uh, the first that needs to be done in any policy, whether it be a city, whether it be a state or a province, or whether it be a uh, country, is to have the natural initiative referendum process, where the people are actually in power. Both put something on the ballot and vote for it as either a, a bypass to the legislature or in partnership with the legislature. Uh, the second is the national electronic town meetings or state electronic town meetings or city electronic town meetings where all the citizens become the general assembly and decide some sort of policy uh, or some sort of direction that society should take. Um, and the third is what I believe should be either half of the city, state, or national legislature that's in place, not just a ad hoc citizen referendum, national initiatives, or uh, our meetings, but an in place legislature, either in the entire legislature as a unicameral legislature, or half of the legislature as a part of a Congress must be chosen by the citizens by random. Uh, can a random legislature actually exist? Can it be effective? Can they deliver it effectively? Can they actually be a good legislature? Uh, Susanna asked why I'm to tell you and explain to you but that's actually done in Canada. Uh, national Electronic Town Meeting she will also tell you about the American speech model she's also been associated with. Um, can the citizens initiate, in, like in Switzerland, which is the only country in the world I consider to be at least half democratic, can they be made more effective through the citizen deliberation process using randomly selected citizens to inform and better inform and involve the citizens this is exactly what Ned Crosby has accomplished by putting a citizen's jury project into the citizen's initiative process. So what I saw in 1976 is already happening here and there and needs to become part of this new Occupy Wall Street movement that is spread around the world. Once they get these pieces and the other pieces that they have been developing, which are innovative and brilliant together, we will have democratic transformation that Thomas was seeing in the 70s, that Ned was thinking of in the 70s, and that I was thinking of in the 70s. And here we are with this conference in Prague at the Master of Democratic Academy having the first Skype conference on the right of democracy. So now I want to turn it over to Ned Crosby, who can tell us about Citizens' jury and how it's now been implemented into the citizens' initiative process in the state Ed? Uh, thanks very much, Ted. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you in the crowd. Some people wonder who I am and think that I am really a 60s radical. <laughs> <laughs> in point of fact, however, uh, I have changed since that time, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit. Uh, about uh, the citizens' jury process and how it's now being used in Oregon. But to give you a little background, uh, the initiative process was introduced into the United States uh, around 1900. And uh, in a period of about 15 years, uh, 24 states out of 50 states in America 
adopted the initiative process uh, and I'm, for many years it served as a good balance to represent the government. Uh, many of the state legislatures around 1800 were very corrupt and uh, the use of the initiative process uh, for direct democracy was a very good balance and correction of that corruption. Uh, the citizens jury process was invented uh, in 1971 by Peter Dino in Germany. He called it a thumbs set. Uh, four months later, I came up with the same idea. Uh, even though I had never heard of Peter Dino, he and I didn't hear of each other until 1985. But the other thing that happened in the 1970s was that uh, the methods of scientific manipulation were perfected in the United States. So at the same time, Dean and I were attempting to uh, get a microcosm of the public uh, together so that they could talk face to face about what they need to do to be done to make society work better. Uh, how old people with a great deal of money were learning how to use uh, some of the tools of social psychology, uh, polling tools, uh, market tested ads to manipulate the public. So that at the time that the citizen jury process was growing in the United States and in Germany, regrettably, what was growing faster was the use of scientific manipulation. And by the 1980s, uh, the uh, manipulation uh, of the voters in the United States was very sophisticated. Uh, this had the result, sadly enough, of undercutting the usefulness of the initiative process in 24 states. Sure. Because what happens typically now, when an initiative is placed upon the ballot, it's important. Millions of dollars uh, come in from all over the United States uh, to run ads uh, which have nothing to do with an informed political dialogue and a great deal to do with how the wealthy uh, attempt to manipulate the public to vote one way or another. So we have been to do the best we could to empower uh, an informed voice of the people. Uh, the citizens' jury process did spread uh, to England uh, in uh, the 1990s, so that by uh, 10 years, in the early 2000s, over 300 citizens' juries have been run uh, in Germany. Uh, well, maybe 200 of them have been run. The idea was spread to Japan and to uh, Australia, Austria, and so forth. But the, um, the problem is uh, that these have not been often run as well as they ought to be run. And furthermore, it became clear that uh, elected officials were much more beholden to powerful interests that helped them get elected. Uh, this being particularly true in the United States where there were four campaign finance laws. So that as the Citizens during the process, the founders of a group in sophistication and the perfected methods, uh, the elected representatives were paying less attention to the process than they had when we introduced it in the 70s and 80s. As a result of this, my wife and I decided to see that we could not uh, get the citizens jury process empowered in the state to evaluate ballot issue. We tried to do this. Uh, in Washington State, uh, we developed a way of uh, setting up a commission that oversees the process and made sure that every time a ballot initiative was put, an initiative was placed on the ballot, uh, that there would be a citizen's jury to evaluate and report to the public. Uh, my wife and I failed in Washington State, uh, but there was success in Oregon so that uh, this year, the Oregon legislature passed a bill saying that a citizen jury would be used to evaluate that initiative. That up to four citizen juries could be evaluated by it. And in the state of Oregon, often there are five and occasionally even ten initiatives on the ballot. They have these statewide initiatives only out of the year. Uh, but the law now says that up to four is to be evaluated through a citizen jury. The really important part of this is that the findings of the citizens, which lasted for five days, 
uh, will then be summarized in a single page and put into the voters' pamphlet or sent out to all the voters in the state and the Secretary of State. And in the state, the Secretary of State does not refer to the office that exists at the national level, but some of you may have heard about the field for foreign affairs. Uh, within the state, the Secretary of State is the person in charge of voting and other matters like that. So the big success in Florida is now that um, uh, ballot initiatives can be evaluated by the citizen jury uh, with the results being placed into voting stamp. In a pilot project done in 2010, uh, there were two initiatives that were evaluated in this way. Uh, in one of the initiatives, it was very interesting because it was on um, uh, repeat sexual offenders and uh, repeat drunk drivers. A polling showed uh, that some two-thirds of the voters uh, in Austin liked the idea because it was written uh, cleverly. Uh, but, uh, and it was uh, then proposing mandatory sentences for repeat offenders who were repeat sex offenders, repeat drunk drivers. Uh, but when the citizens jury convened, the third uh, uh, how the bill was written, a close look at it. When they took their final vote, there was 21 opposed to the initiative and only three in favor. A huge switch from the way that they thought about it as a whole. Uh, when these uh, results were put into the voters' hand last year, a survey showed uh, that it swung the vote nine percentage points against the initiative. And we believe this is a very important fact. Uh, the first time that this was used publicly in Oregon. It was not enough to defeat the uh, measure because the public, indeed, uh, those who did not see the recommendations of the citizens jury still voted two thirds in favor. The end result was that 57% of the voters voted in favor of this initiative, but it would have been much higher if the citizens' initiative would be not taken place. So, uh, those who are interested in this process, should take a close look at the law because one of the most innovative things that we've done is to work to find out how a commission can be set up uh, within state government to be trusted to run this process properly. We've given a great deal of thought to this because in the United States so many people distrust government uh, and normally a commission uh, within the United States, be it national or within the state, the commission uh, has members who are appointed by the governor. The governor, of course, goes along with the political uh, thinking of the time, and the commission ends up serving uh, the um, wishes of the powerful rather than the wishes of the people. We think we have an innovative structure for making sure that the commission serves the wishes of the people. I won't go into the details here, uh, but it is something that's important, and we hope that this will spread to others. So I believe that that's really what I wanted to get across, the idea that uh, uh, Peter Dino in Germany and I in the United States thought of in 1971. For 40 years, the last has been popular in a single state in the United States, and we hope it will spread. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ed. Uh, I, think, I, I learned a lot. I agree with you more on the analysis of, of what's happened in the United States. And I <coughs> anybody talking about an instituting uh, initiative uh, into a local, uh, provincial, state, national level, then your model of a citizen's jury needs to be an important part of that process because it is the deliberative part to the direct democracy part and there's a way using your stratified samples of citizens of, uh, in a five-day deliberation of trying to overcome the advertising and the misinformation that is spread about it through advertising. So I think that anybody uh, thinking about changing their system needs to incorporate this and to also incorporate how the results of the citizens are being spread to the citizens, not only through the voters' pamphlet, certainly online, and Facebook and Twitter and various other ways where people can actually see it, getting it through a pamphlet in the mail is not the best way of distributing the results. So I'd like, now I'd like to switch to Susanna Haas-Lyons, who will describe how this idea of the two other aspects of what I said in 76, the national uh, town, electronic town meetings, 
and the a random citizens legislature actually work in practice. From Vancouver, Suzanne on this line. Thank you, Ted. As a site's note, the floor is sharing uh, about the institutionalization of the citizens' juries, and it truly is a very exciting initiative to see the citizens' juries be incorporated into a decision-making process that really does need a bit more reasoned and dialogic thinking applied to it. So congratulations, it's so exciting to watch. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is primarily the British Columbia Citizens' Assembly on Electoral Reform. Um, this was recently shortlisted on the Mo for the Moon Prize of Revitalizing Democracy um, based in, uh, in Germany, primarily because it had a truly innovative and historic aspect to it. Um, as we've heard up until now, the idea of bringing citizens together to wrestle with key issues is, is fairly, um, has been thought about quite a bit. But what made the British Columbia Citizens Assembly a different exercise was that the recommendations of the group of individuals that got together went directly to referendum, which meant that um, it wasn't just a group of people making a recommendation and putting it out there in the ether. It wasn't going into a report that was going to sit on a shelf. But instead, the work of these citizens, and it was substantial work, I'll walk you through the process in a moment, went directly to their fellow citizens as a recommendation to make a choice on as a refer in a referendum in a, uh, 2005. So um, that's what made it truly historic, and the process itself bored on a lot of the thinking that came before that you've heard about earlier. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the Assembly. Um, the British Columbia Citizens Assembly happened in 2004, and it was created by the British Columbia government. And the government created the citizen body and charged them with evaluating the way we currently vote in, uh, in British Columbia, in the province, how we basically turn votes into seats. And um, so this is known as electoral systems. And they decided to turn this question over to citizens because there had been about 10 years of fairly substantial discontent at the results of our current electoral system. I'll spare you the details, but there have been a number of anomalies or um, unusual outcomes from our elections. And so at this point, there had been a, some dissatisfaction. And the, the government said, well, if we decide what the changes should look like, our interests are too much at stake. And um, it may not be perceived as a fair recommendation. So they turned it over to citizens who themselves could learn about the issues and come up with a recommendation that was based on a citizen perspective. So how the process worked, there was four phases. The first phase was selection. And the, hunt, the, the a citizen assembly was composed of 160 citizens, one man and one woman from each electoral district across the province. We used a random selection method from the voters list. And um, this provided us with a fairly nice selection of diverse individuals from around the province. Not only diversity in gender, but also in age, clearly geography, because we use electoral districts, but levels of education, income, and status um, at, in terms of the, the immigration status, how long they've been in Canada. Um, one of the things that didn't come out in terms of um, the random selection process was there was no First Nations representation or Indigenous representation. And in British Columbia, there is a substantial uh, First Nations population. And so we went back out to the list of folks that had been initially contacted, asked people to self-identify as First Nations, and then we went back and selected two additional members to ensure that we actually did have a perspective of an important constituency in the province. So that was the selection process. We ended up with a representative group of 160 citizens. And we had a fairly big ask for them. What we were asking them to do was to commit one year of um, stage two was learning, stage three was going out to the public to hear what the public thought, and stage four was to deliberate together. So in the learning phase, and actually I've got um, uh, an image here to help you uh, imagine what um, oh, I can't share my screen. That's too bad. Okay. All right. I was going to show you a picture of it. But so, so I want you to imagine. 
The folks were prepared, sitting together in a room of concentric circles where the center table was one round table and then they had round um, benches around that where there was no front and no back of the room. People were not facing, um, everybody facing one speaker. Instead, everyone was facing each other. It's a wonderful room. I encourage you to Google the image of the WASP Center for Dialogue in Vancouver, Canada, um, where there's... Oh, it's a, pardon me? Spell WASP. Thank you. It W-O-S-K. Um, Center for Dialogue, or if you look up images of the BC Citizens Assembly, you'll see some of these images, where it's truly a democratic physical setup, where everyone is treated equally in the room. So in the learning phase, we would go through um, uh, a cycle where we have uh, expert academics present on the issues, um, give some information about electoral systems, and then people would break up in small discussion groups where they'd have a facilitator and they'd talk about their values and ask questions about what they just learned, wrestle with the issues a little bit, and then everyone would come back together in a large group to share what they thought and to hear from each other and express their own opinions. So we did that for three months where they could learn about the issues. Then the citizens went out to the public and said, what's important to you about the way we vote in British Columbia? And um, they had 50 hearings, over 3,000 people participated in person around the province, as well as um, thousands of online submissions in terms of recommendations. They had the summer off, and then in the fall of 2004, they created, um, they, they deliberated. They said, okay, so we've, we've learned, we've listened, now we're going to make some decisions. And they, they started from a values-based perspective. What's important to us about electoral systems? And they identified three values, um, voter choice, local representation, and proportionality. And they used those values to help them select two alternative systems. They crafted in detail the two systems uh, as alternatives. They chose which one they liked better out of those two. And then they said, OK, so if this is our best alternative, is it better than our current system? And they thought about it and they said, yes, actually it is. So they made a recommendation for a change. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this recommendation then went directly to the rest of the public in a provincial election where people were asked, do you wish to um, change our electoral system to the system recommended by the British Columbia Citizens Assembly? Um, the result of the referendum was very close, but it did not pass. Um, in order so that this was a substantial change to how the democracy works in British Columbia. So they, the government set a very high bar for change, meaning that 60%, um, 60% of the population as a whole would have to support the change, plus a simple majority in 60% of the items. So the, but that's actually, it's a fairly uh, large group of people. It, typically in our electoral system, 50% is the mark for change. So it got very, very close. In terms of the 60% overall, it reached 57.7% reached support. So just, just a 2.3% shy of the initial mark. And then when you looked at support overall in the, um, overall in the electoral districts, 97, uh, sorry, 67 out of the 69 uh, ridings supported the change. So it was um, very, very close, but it didn't pass. So this was left with, clearly there's a mandate, an interest in change, but they didn't reach the threshold, so what should they do? And the British Columbia government said, we'll hold another referendum at the next provincial election. And they did that. However, one of the reasons um, that research shows that um, the Citizens Assembly did so well was because people might not have understood the electoral system being recommended, but they trusted the Citizens Assembly members. They saw them as representatives of themselves. That yes, they, had, they were no longer uh, regular citizens where they, um, were, they were just like everybody else who didn't know much about electoral systems. They now had more knowledge, but they had the same values and interests. As the, as the regular population, and people trusted that. So there was a high support for it um, in the referendum, whereas uh, 
in the in the second uh, in the second boat, there was uh, it was too far away, too distant from the citizens' assembly, and also people's sense of discontent about the results of the electoral system was no longer as fresh. And for a variety of reasons I could talk more about, um, it had a, a much much less uh, robust response in the second uh, referendum vote and so much confidence. So you could decide to evaluate the citizens' assembly on whether or not the referendum passed, and certainly that's a valid criteria. However, there are other measures to apply to the citizens' assembly to determine its success or not, one of which being its impact on individuals. And um, what we saw is that the individuals involved in the citizens' assembly, um, and I'm just going to pull up my uh, slide here, I know that you can't see it, but I've got some statistics I wanted to show you. Um, the, the, so some of our researchers looked and they, what they found was that the members of the Citizens' Assembly transformed from being just simple voters into citizens, meaning that they became much more interested in politics, substantially, from before they were participating to after. They were more attentive to, to the news about the politics, whereas 40% might pay attention before, they, um, they were now 70% paying attention quite a bit to politics before. Um, and they, were, they felt themselves more confirmed, and they become very much more active. 60% did newspaper interviews. I mean, you think about the red population. So few of us have talked to, talked to the media or had sent information to the media, and, and well over half have done this. Um, half of the members gave public talks to their communities. People wrote letters, they uh, and participated on radio, and they just themselves saw themselves as being knowledgeable individuals in society and, and had a worthwhile and valid opportunity to talk to the, their fellow community members. So that's, that's one of the kind of changes we can think about. And then, and then another way to evaluate the success of the assembly was that this method itself inspired further applications of the method. In Ontario, Canada, the provincial government followed the exact same methodology, as well the Netherlands did the same. And so you can see here that there was actually significant positive impact from the application of this methodology. Um, I'll stop there about the Citizens' Assembly, and I'm, I'm glad to answer any questions about this method um, when we have a conversation. I'll just speak briefly about the 21st century town meeting method, as Ted had asked me to do that. So um, for uh, about three years, I worked in the United States with an organization called America Speaks, plus um, I've been an associate for them for about six years, where um, the America Speaks methodology is called 21st century town meeting. And what's extraordinary about the format is that they bring very large groups of citizens together, um, hundreds or thousands of people. A typical size is 1,000 people meeting for an entire day. They arrive for breakfast and they stay till um, early afternoon or late afternoon and spend a whole day, everybody around one small discussion table with a facilitator, wrestling with issues in a dialogic way and coming to deliberation and coming to agreements about the issues. And so some of the issues that might be at the table of these meetings are things like rebuilding after Hurricane Katrina, or revival, uh, um, reforming a healthcare system in, this, in the state of California, um, revitalizing the economy of East Ohio. Um, there's been um, dozens and dozens of these meetings, all on issues that matter to a wide group of people. <coughs> So you'll have a thousand people in the room, everybody around a small discussion table, say 10 people, so you have a room filled with small, small discussions. And at each table is a laptop computer where people are, um, the agreements being discussed at the table are entered into the computer and sent live over to the people at the edge of the room called the theme team. Now the theme team is made up, just like the people in the room, be representative of the overall population and um, they are reading the information as it's coming in, looking for what's being commonly said, and pulling out, oh, I've heard this a number of times, I think this is a theme. And in an incredibly fast turnaround, at the end of, say, a half an hour discussion, 
The theme chief is able to pull out, still the results, all the small different tables of conversations, and then reflect back on large screens and say, the lead facilitator will say, okay, you just had a conversation, for example, about what's, what are the most important issues in our community? Well, here's what we heard you say. And people will clap and they'll point and they'll say, hey, my table talked about that. Because it is representative of what's most commonly discussed. And then the second technology is incorporated where the lead facilitator will say, okay, so now we know what's important to you. Tell us what's most important. And each person has a handheld voting keypad. Well, we'll then use their keypad to choose, say, one or two or three issues out of that list that are most important to them. And then right away, you've got a prioritized list. And then you can take this information and say, okay, so if healthcare is the most important issue to us, take that back to your tables and let's talk about who needs to take action on this issue. And, um, and then you'll have this fast, iterative cycle. We are able to cover an enormous amount of information in a very short amount of time. And, um, and then the results of that are then incorporated into a decision-making process. So I talked about the technology. I talked briefly about the fact that the people in the room are demographically representative of the population most affected by the issue. Um, thirdly, these kinds of 20% of town meetings part of decision-making processes. They're, they're not about um, just coming up with ideas. Instead, um, if a 20% of town meeting is to go forward, the people responsible for acting on those issues will be involved inside in, 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 in the ethical meeting. So the governor will be there at the end of the day and say, we're listening. Or the mayor will be there and say, we need your help to decide what's next. So it's embedded into a policy process. Um, there's a variety of, of other aspects, but I encourage you to take a look at a video on YouTube to see the process. It's, it's quite extraordinary and an electronic town meeting where that allows lots of people to have intimate conversations but multiply them close to you truly get um, an increased amount of the informed population plus informed recommendations to help influence action. The last thing I'll say about the electronic meeting is that it's not required that everybody meet in one physical location. Because of technology, you can have many sites being simultaneously. And a great example of that is the work that we did in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. We had five major sites where two and a half, uh, um, I think, uh, 2,000 people meeting in these five different sites by satellite television. So where they were? Um, they were in Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans. So they were in those five locations, people meeting in this format, and all of their ideas from all five sites being sent over to the theme team and then reported back as a whole. And they were mostly refugees, refugees from Katrina. They were refugees from Katrina from New Orleans. That's right, yeah. Plus an additional 16 small community sites around the country because the refugees from Katrina were distributed throughout the, the, the states. And so um, these uh, additional 16 sites were able to connect via computer and internet where they also were contributing their ideas. So it's a, it's a phenomenal methodology for ensuring that people have informed conversation, listen, get a chance to have their own voice heard, hear from their friend, their neighbors and friends to understand the perspectives of others, and then have all of their ideas grouped together, prioritized, and then fed into a policy process. So for the example of Hurricane Katrina, the result was a plan for rebuilding the city that reflected the priorities of the people who lived there. And, for the, and the development of this plan allowed federal rebuilding funds to finally flow back to the city after two years of failed, other failed policy processes. So it's, it's quite extraordinary uh, methodology, and uh, I'd also be glad to answer questions about that. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And, uh, as you see, the way all the, it should all be embedded into the citizen decision-making process. So I think that that about concludes what we'll say from here to Erie, and uh, we're open to questions from the audience. Could, could, could I? Could I get a short comment? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we, it's really impressive what uh, Ned and Susanna are reporting about. And I 
actual decision uh, participation in, in decision making. Uh, I, I would sort of try to comment from a European perspective, and unfortunately we are not we are not quite there yet. But what is happening is that the initiative making process is being looked upon more positively. And there is now legislation on the European level that if you collect one million uh, citizen uh, supporters, uh, you can force the European government to take up a certain, certain matter. And there is a new legislation in Sweden where, uh, where 10% of a certain community can force uh, at least the, uh, the politicians to, to, to investigate uh, a certain matter. So, um, uh, we could, I have to add from the European perspective that we are still uh, on the way, but we are not as uh, successful as, as, as you have been reporting here in uh, Susanna, which is very exciting. Thank you. Okay, uh, if the people uh, in Prague want to ask us questions, we're over. Yes, thank you for giving us this information uh, and uh, if somebody here in this hall has some questions, please let us use this opportunity and uh, ask them. Dr. Rubets or Barbets or Mr. Kantor or Ms. Kotishwa might have some questions, so if you have Please just ask. I don't know how, how it would work in, in practice because I have a microphone here, so maybe it would be necessary to come here to, to this table and take the microphone in your hand, I, I believe. Perhaps uh, the methodology that uh, Susanna you've described is uh, uh, written down somewhere in detail so that like, it's easy to copy it and maybe develop it and, and use it uh, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, <clears throat> there's a wonderful resource that would describe a number of the methods that we've talked about today um, that I recommend online. It's called Participedia. Um, and it's spelled, I'm just going to look to make sure I got it right, P-A-R-T-I-C-I-P-E-D-I-A dot com. And um, some, uh, some of our leading academics in North America have been behind developing this online resource for public engagement methodologies. <clears throat> and you can find both cases and some of the methods described in detail um, on the website. And the BC Citizens Assembly write-up is very good, and I think there's some examples as well from this, um, from America Speaks, particularly, I think, the Hurricane Katrina one. Um, so that's a, that's a very great resource I recommend because it does come from an academic perspective, so it walks through a number of the key principles. Um, and then additionally, um, America Speaks has some great videos. Um, and you know what? Um, there's, uh, there's a YouTube page for videos of deliberative democracy projects, and perhaps I can um, email it to Ted, and Ted can pass it on to his contact at the conference and, and share it with you folks so you can actually see some of these things in action. I'll do that. Okay. I'll do that. By the way, I'd like to just mention one thing. Thank you. Somebody, somebody who's, uh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, if somebody's name that should be mentioned here, uh, because she's a, a very prominent person. She's the person who founded America Speaks, and it's a friend of mine. Her name is Carolyn J. Wilkins Meyer, and she had put together the 21st Century Electronic Town Meeting model that can be done at the national level, as Susan has said, at the local level, like in Katrina, California level, and the health issues. It's a brilliant model of electronic town meetings. I am one of the originators of this electronic company concept. And Carolyn came in in the 70s and 80s. When Carolyn came in the 90s, she came in, we talked, and she has taken some of my ideas and expanded on them and made it into a far greater uh, project, idea, concept, and operation 
than I ever thought of. So I just wanted to mention her as somebody that's not in this uh, meeting that is a very great practitioner and theorist of the dark. Uh, could I just uh, add to Susanna that uh, there is a newsletter, uh, of course, uh, from Monkey Speaks, which, which is uh, very helpful if you want to regularly follow what they're doing, and it is really exciting. Yeah, perfect. Speak to me. There is also a newsletter which I am publishing from time to time. So please, 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 please that send me the information you have just mentioned, and I will put it into the next issue. You will, you will have my address, so there will be no problem at this point. If you don't know, send it to Susanna. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? More questions? <coughs> Comments? So, it looks like we have exhausted the topics of this project. So, I, I would like to thank you very much, all panelists abroad and all participants of the conference who are sitting in this hall and I hope... It's our pleasure, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We would love to do it. And I want to thank all you for this. You did great. Good. Hey, Yuri, is there any way that this, that this is... Uh, I think the name of it will capture this online or on video. Uh, ah, yes, 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 I have asked the technicians here and they, they are putting it on the video so there will be some records about this. this event. I don't know in what form, but uh, it will be recorded. I will on YouTube. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.